Arts and Letters is a live event we do on the campus of UCR Palm Desert, and we never do it in the summertime. Um, however, why not do it in the summer? We're all home, and there's a great book app. Uh, and that great book is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, which I have right here in my hand. Um, Arts and Letters, we've been doing it for about, uh, gosh, 10 years, and we're going to start it all up again uh, with a regular schedule uh, in September and run throughout the entire academic year. And I can already tell you it's going to be a great season. Uh, I know already that in September we'll be joined by the fantastic novelist Darren Strauss on September 8th. So uh, stick around, um, check your email, you'll get a... Uh, we get an email about that coming up. Um, but it's gonna be a great list. We're, we're gonna keep doing um, Arts and Letters as often as we can um, online because we, we can, which is the, the great part of uh, this vast global pandemic that hopefully we're out of soon. Um, tonight though, we're very lucky to have with us Stephen Graham Jones, the author of The Only Good Indians. I'm going to read a portion of his bio uh, because it's actually so long that it would take the majority of our time for me to say it all, but I'll say the good stuff. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones is the author of about 30 books, <laughs> maybe more, um, and novellas and short story collections. Uh, he has also been a NEA recipient. He won the Texas Institute of Letters Award for Fiction, the Independent Publishers Award for Multicultural Fiction, a Bram Stoker Award. Uh, he has been a finalist or winner of every major award in the horror genre. Um, and he also is a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder and in the low residency MFA here at UCR. He is one of the finest horror writers in the world, but I also just think one of the finest writers uh, in human existence. I'm a huge, big fan of Stevens, um, and he's my friend also, so it's really cool to see all the amazing things that are happening for him for this brand new book. Uh, they are certainly deserved. So ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Grant Jones! Woo! And Stephen, you shame me by dressing so nicely, my gosh. <laughs> There's no excuse to dress up anymore, so I have to like make my own excuses, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah. You look like you could be, uh, you know, opening up for Johnny Cash later, well, whereas I look like I could be playing golf with Johnny Cash. <laughs> 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 so we're going to talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about, um, about the new book. Obviously, we won't give away too many spoilers because I know a lot of you probably haven't finished it yet. It just came out uh, about two weeks ago. Um, it's been getting rave reviews everywhere. I was listening to NPR earlier today and was surprised to hear uh, it on NPR, which is really cool. Uh, it's now sanctioned by the government, apparently. Stephen is sanctioned <laughs> by the government. Um, so we're going to talk to Stephen about his, about his life and his career, um, and then we're going to open it up for questions from all of you. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A box down there on the bottom right of your screen. Um, also in the chat section, uh, our fantastic director of marketing, Maggie Downs, is posting interesting links and talking to you guys. So feel free to continue the conversation uh, there. But let's get started. Um, Stephen, as a horror writer, how's this vast global pandemic treating you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess the big difference for me has been that without travel, I'm not writing on an air airplane seat back tray you know because i do so much riding in airplanes i'm always right. so glad when the captain says we're going to circle we're going to go to this airport i'm like all right that's 45 more minutes of riding you know because when i'm up there in the sky i'm not on messaging i'm not on email i'm not on social media and it's like a little cocoon i can ride in but as you know the bad thing the bad part about that is the person in the seat beside you is like watching every word you write you know right. and but <laughs> so that's been that's been the really big difference for me and I guess the other difference has been, I don't know if this really has to do with being a horror writer. Maybe it does. That I eat a lot. I eat a, I eat a lot less lollipops these days because of masks. You know, um, I like to just get a lollipop and go walk around Walmart or Home Depot and be happy. But you can't do that anymore. No lollipops. Right? Well, and it's it's frankly it's creepy when there's some, <laughs> some man dressed full in black <laughs> stuck in a lollipop walking alone through the Walmart <laughs> toy section. Stephen, no one wants to see. Yeah. That. <laughs> you know, the, the thing that I was uh, wondering while reading this book, but also just thinking about horror writing in general in this time is when so many people are dealing with sort of a base level of terror management, like on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, but it's your job when you're sitting at home to work. And I don't know if you're writing something new at this moment. Mm -hmm. Does the time change your ability to freak people out or to scare people or your desire to want to do it when everyone's sort of scared anyway? 
no, I want to do it all the time. Like one of my favorite things to do is to put on a mask and hide around the corner and scare my family or my dogs, you that's know? Right. And, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that impulse, I think it's like hardwired in. And so, no, the impulse is the same for sure. And I don't feel guilt for it. Like you're right. Everybody is scared and anxious right now, but I don't feel particularly bad about scaring them worse. You know, um, really, I think what horror does in, in times like these is, in a horror story or a novel or a movie or whatever horror you engage, it lets you process through from beginning to end. And that for me, who is now in the middle of a horror story with the world for all of us, that if we engage stories that have a beginning and an end, that kind of tells us that there's going to be an end eventually. That right. well, there'll be, there'll be light at the end of the tunnel. Well, and that's sort of like why, um, why I like, crime fiction so much or the kind of crime fiction that I like is because invariably it's about someone who walks into chaos and writes it. Yeah. In reading horror, it, presuming you are most interested in the person who ends up living at the end, <laughs> it, does, it does provide hope. Yeah. Um, but in this book, you know, the, the, the empathetic thread, um, you find it shifting sort of page to page and character mm -hmm. to character, at least I did. Mm -hmm. Um, because you essentially have five main characters throughout um, throughout the book at different at different mm -hmm. junctures, and I you know what you do so skillfully I think is um, you you make our allegiances shift over and over again so that the fear never stops, and I think that's a unique thing in a book like this because mm -hmm. invariably in most books there's that one hero mm -hmm. who makes it through that lone survivor, mm -hmm. but in this book we have no idea who that lone survivor is going. Yeah, to be. you know you're right, and hopefully hopefully you might have felt or somebody might have felt a sense of like allegiance or empathy with the kind of spirit of vengeance in here too, you know, because mm -hmm. you understand why this entity is doing what it's doing. I hope you do anyways, you know, but, um, but yeah, like um, it is always kind of fake when you have a protagonist or a hero or a final girl who's on the charmed path moving through the story and you know, nothing's really going to get to them that the mortal stakes are going to be for everybody around them. And that, right. that, that to me isn't true dread or tension. That's kind of fake, fakey, you know? So I right. tried to do it different if I could. Yeah, well, you did. I mean, I, I think, and we'll, we'll get to this more in, in detail in a sec, but you know, you, you tip over convention for the horror novel, you tip over convention for social and cultural norms. Uh, you, you tip over convention in language over and over and over again. Everything that you're doing in this book, you know, it, a lot of the book is about these rituals that we repeat. And so the reader, or at least this reader, is expecting one thing because you're hitting things so hard on ritual mm -hmm. and then you're tipping that ritual upside down. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this was a choice. Am, am, am I correct yeah, in that assumption? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, wanted, I mean, to me, the only fun stories to tell are stories that um, push back at either the world or the genre or the form, probably one of those three, you know, or sometimes it's a specific person you're pushing back against as well. But, um, but yeah, I always want to be pushing back against like, like the slasher formula is a ritual as like Kevin in the woods told us, you know, and it's, it's got its distinct steps and everything. And um, yeah, I wanted to, of course, and I don't push against things because I don't believe in them. I push in them because I want to make them better, if that makes sense. Because I think yeah. if you test if you test something and it passes that test, then it's better than it was in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let, let's go back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the point um, sort of growing up when you decided, well, I don't want to just read this stuff. I want to I want to make it. Um, um, it was never an option. I grew up. As, in the cotton fields and oil fields of West Texas. And so you, you were, you were either going to be a farmer or go to the oil field. And that, that's the only two options. I, I never planned on going to college. I didn't really graduate high school. Um, like school and writing was never even on the distant, distant horizon. But then in the second semester of my freshman year of college, which I never planned, as I say, I never planned to go to college. My mom gave me the first semester as a gift because she said, you like to read, you should go be with people who read, you know? And it was the greatest gift ever, of course. Mm -hmm. Moms kind of know that, I think. Um, <laughs> but I was sitting in World Lit 2 and they were, you know, the professor was like, it's a 300 person classroom. And there's like a professor up there talking about Spencer or Paradise Lost or something. And, and I'm back there at the pen in a spiral and I'm, 
taking notes or pretending to take notes or lying to myself that I'm going to take notes. Anyways, these two police officers walk in and they lower their, you know, their chrome sunglasses and start casing the place. And I, I sink down lower and lower in my chair because I know they're there for me because they're right. always, every time cops are in the room, it's always, Stephen, can you come out with us? And sure enough, they see me and they say, Stephen, can you come out with us? And so I waltz up in the hall with them and I'm not volunteering anything. I learned a long time ago, you don't volunteer stuff with the police. You wait for them to tell you what they think you right. did. So then you can come up with a good alibi. Yeah. But right. um, yeah. it turns out it was not for anything I had done. One of my uncles had been burned terribly badly in the town I was in, had the best burn unit in the region and they had airlifted my uncle there. And I was the only family member they could find. And so mm -hmm. the police took me to the burn unit. And so I sat there for three days, three nights, waiting for him to live or die. And all I had was that pin in that spiral. And so I wrote a story just to keep myself busy. When I came back to comp the next Monday after missing class for two days, I said, I didn't have the personal essay I was supposed to have written. And I pulled, tore those pages out of my spiral and I said, here to my comp teacher, this will prove that I was doing some writing anyways. I thought I'd get like super partial credit. And turns out she liked the story. She typed it up for me. I didn't have any kind of word processor or typewriter or anything. And she entered it into a departmental contest, which I won. And so I got a check for $150 just for telling lies and jokes, you know? And That's that was like- a little hunting shit right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like a bell going off in my head. And so I just kept doing that all through undergrad. I kept telling lies and jokes and lucking into awards you know and so I, I never really thought like i want to be a storyteller uh i just had i had luck with sentences and luck with mm -hmm. story i really if my i have luck with endings i think and i'm i think endings are an instinct i don't think endings are something you can necessarily work up your muscles for if that makes sense i mm -hmm. think some people i think you just some people are just lucky with endings and I was lucky with endings back then. And so it worked out and I just kept doing it. Um, oh, I do see a, a question just popped up. Did your uncle yeah. live or die? That's an important he lived. question. He lived. Yeah, he lived. He was long, long recovery, still recovering, but he lived. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, I think the, the challenge, I think for a lot of young men, particularly when they get interested in some sort of art is it's not cool, you know, and it's not the thing that you should be doing. And I know that you're an athlete and I know that, you know, at, playing basketball has always permeated a, a lot of your books over the course of you know, the yeah. last 20 years. Yeah. Um, were you telling your friends, hey, this is the thing that I'm into now. I'm writing books in addition mm -hmm. to shooting hoops or drinking beer or getting into fights or whatever. You know, I had the whole time growing up, I'd always had a paperback, like a Mickey's flame paperback in my back pocket. And so I was always I was always ducking around the corner to read a book, you know, and so I had already, I feel like I'd already been rasped for that my whole life. And then I went to college and I declared myself a philosophy major. And so what my family was all telling me whenever I come home was, can't wait for you to graduate so you can go work in the philosophy plant, you know? And, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, my friends, yeah, I told them I was writing and they would say, cool, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven. Like it didn't, it didn't matter to any of them what I was right. doing. I, really, I was just hiding from work because they were all, they were all already working in lube shops in the oil field, doing all the military and everything. And so I was just like, I'd found a temporary way out of all that, you know? Mm. What was the thing that, uh, and I presume you were reading genre fiction as a kid too. What, what was the thing that first attracted you to, um, you know, reading books that existed outside of your own real world? You know, it was, I guess it's completely random. Um, I was probably about 11, somewhere around there. And that same uncle who ended up in the burn unit at ICU, um, I was over at his house one day and he said, hey man, I know that you're always reading. And I was, I, like if I didn't have a book in my hand, then I'd go to my grandmother's Lazy Susan and I'd spin it and wait for it to stop. And I'd pull out a can of beans and I'd read, read it front and back, put it back, spin it, read another can of soup or whatever, because I had to be reading. Reading just made me feel whole. And he said, I notice you're reading all the time. Why don't you come, come down here and look at this? And so he led me down his hall and opened up his linen closet, but it wasn't a linen closet, it was a library. He had um, Mac Bolin, Louis L'Amour, mm -hmm. Conan the Barbarian, paper, mass market paperbacks, front to back, like probably 14 deep and sealing the floor. And he said, pick three of those. And so I picked three and he said, when you're done with those, come back, I'll give you three more. And I worked through his closet like that. I worked through every L'Amour, every Conan, I, like, I didn't like Mac Bolin a whole lot, but I loved Conan and I love Louis L'Amour, you know? And Mac, yeah, Mac Bolin was always bullshit because Mac yeah, Bolin yeah. was always taking on the entire mafia. 
by oh, himself. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the covers are cool, but yeah, it's kind of not completely exactly. believable. Yeah. Like Don Pendleton, I don't think he, I don't think he knew the realities <laughs> of armed warfare as, as well as he thought he did. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it, you know, once folks start to read uh, the only good Indians, if they haven't started to read it, you know, what you just told us is going to ring some bells um, because Lewis, the first main character that we meet, he keeps his paperback books in a, a linen closet on the top of his stairs. Um, yeah. You know, we, we steal from our lives all the time, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, that's sort of the cool thing sometimes is you, you meet someone and, and you find out uh, the, the Easter eggs of their life. But I mean, really what I've always noticed in your work is that you have certain obsessions, you know, the, the things that you are possessed by and that you're obsessed by show up again and again in, in your work. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that's part of what you're reading too, is like to, to feed the things that you were concerned about or worried about as a young person. Yeah, it could have been like, um, like we were talking about this before this event started, there's lots of dogs in my fiction, you know? Well, briefly. And, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> um, and I, you know, I grew up on a farm and so it seemed like every month I had a different dog because tragedy and calamity strikes farm dogs like left and right you know like they're running through a gauntlet and they don't make it very often you know and it's not because of carelessness on our part it's just because there's big wheels moving around there's dangerous equipment and there's rattlesnakes and there's neighbors with guns and everything you know there's all kinds of things that can take care of your dog and um so i suspect that like the reason there's dogs in my fiction is probably just because i cycled through so many dogs as a kid yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, there, there are a lot of animals in general in your books. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. readers, if, if you're just coming to Stephen Graham Jones early, what I should tell you is that he's a lover of animals. And what happens to them in his books is nothing about the man himself. Correct. <laughs> um, so... You know, this book to me feels like um, a culmination of a, a, a change in your career, a, a different period of your writing that I think um, Growing Up Dead in Texas was a part of, and then Mongrels was a big part of, and then that this seems to be a, an even bigger part of, which is you looking at yourself, looking at the horror genre, and looking at your role as a Native American person in this genre um, and, and how the world is different through your eyes. Um, is, is this correct in my, in my assumption? That, that is correct. Like in when my first, let's see, my first two novels came out, I guess, I kept doing book events for them. This is like 2000, 2002. And people kept asking me questions about um, Indian history, Indian culture. And it, it felt to me like they were using the books as a lens onto like some big tragedy they felt they should feel guilty for or something like mm -hmm. that. And um, I mean, they should feel guilty for it. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but I don't want to be the agent of their guilt. Um, <laughs> this is just but, blown um, up on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I got tired of getting all those questions. So I said, screw y'all. And I went and I, I started writing zombies and slashers and, vampires and werewolves and I said you know try to find the Indian stuff in here you know right but at the same time I still had this and I still have it this fascination with um like formal tricks I guess you know like just I love I love problematized narratives I love it when I read a story that presents as a recipe but it's actually a story I love those kind of tricks forever and ever and ever and I love like epistolary and second person and dramatic monologue and I, I just I can I live for that kind of stuff so while, while I was on one side writing all the zombies and werewolves and everything that I loved and they're so close to my heart, I was on another path at the same time, taking tricks, you know, not, not taking tricks, taking chances, formal chances, doing weird novels that shouldn't have worked and maybe don't work. I don't know. And, but then with mongrels, well, really, you're right with Growing Up Dead in Texas, because Growing Up Dead in Texas was me kind of trying to um, interrogate the fascination with um, memoir, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what if I tell this as if it's real, but I know it's not real, but people like it anyway, will they hate me? You know, which right. is a weird test to do to see will <laughs> they hate me. <laughs> but then but then finally with mongrels, I was able to do werewolves, which are the closest to my heart of anything. 
and mix that with like formal tricks, um, like flash fiction sandwiched between stories that serve as chapters, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so in 2016, when that came out, I feel like I became one writer again. And since then, yeah, I've been doing, I feel like I've been doing different stuff and I, I shouldn't put it all on. It's not all just me either. Um, I got a new agent right around that time too, BJ Robbins, who, who you know, and she like, um, like told me what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do. And it's, uh, that's what, I, that's what I need. I need people to tell me what to do. Cause if I make my own decisions, things always go south, but BJ is really smart and she looks ahead and she tells me you can't do five books in a year anymore. That doesn't help anybody. And, um, <laughs> and yes. And, and then when I give her manuscripts, she rakes them across the coals and I'm like, good grief. You must hate this book, but really she, she gets better and better and better. Mm. You know, and that, that's the kind of agent we should all have, I think. Well, well, and isn't that also sort of part of the growing up process as an artist? Like when we were younger people, like we thought probably that the world owed us a lot. Like the world is demanding my work. They must mm. have my mm. work. Mm -hmm. And then of course you get older and you realize that nothing is deserved. You got to work for, for all of this stuff. And you got to listen to the people that have yeah. good games for you too. Um, yeah, for sure. And so, I mean, and so for me, when I read your work, when I read this book specifically, mm -hmm. like I'm seeing a writer who has all of their powers harnessed, mm -hmm. that you can do anything. You can shift point of view. You can shift point of view in a sentence if you mm -hmm. want to. You can suddenly let the reader know that the narrative voice is speaking to the ghost of a dead elk. Um, and you don't know why that's happening, but it's happening. And you don't ever stop even to explain it. You just let it be. And it's a real trust in the reader. And for me, it feels like it's you saying, I trust you because you know that I'm breaking these conventions um, and that you're smart enough to follow along. I mean, this is commercial fiction that you're writing, but yeah. it's commercial fiction of a, of a higher order, basically. You're really demanding a lot from the reader. Yeah, yeah you, I mean, um, a lot, one thing is, you know, as everybody out there knows, you should never write down to your audience. You know, you always assume your audience is like 10% smarter than you. That's what I do anyways. And it's not, it's not like a great leap to suspect that either, you know, <laughs> but, um, um, but yes, I, I do trust the audience to like, this is a slasher. It's, it's mm -hmm. like Jason or Freddie or Michael Myers or something. And I trust that even if people don't like the slasher, they still know the basic formula of the slasher. Like there's a prank, wait a few years for that to collect interest. And then here comes, some killer who has a really disproportionate response to having their pants pulled down on the playground, you know, and they're right. going to carve through the prom or something like that. Um, people know those beats. And so, and because people know those beats just from um, like osmosis through the culture, I feel like I can disturb them a little and mm -hmm. emphasize this instead of that, you know? Well, and for this book too, you know, you're, you're dealing with cliche from the from the cover and the title to the very last moments of the book so you're making also the reader uncomfortable because of the cultural cliches that we are ingrained with from the from the very title which is uh, it, it was a theodore roosevelt or someone who said the only good indian is a dead indian yeah, yeah um great guy what a wonderful american president yeah uh, one in a, one in a list of forty five <laughs> wonderful ones. We're, what a, what an era! Um, so, and then from the first page on, you're dealing with these things, and and your characters know the same cliches, and they know the same jokes, and they're dealing with them over and over and over again. Can you talk a little bit about the, the like the choice to make the reader uncomfortable in their own biases? Yeah, no, I think that's, well, uh, that's how you make them aware of their biases, I think. Or that's probably the only, only way I really know to do it anyways, is to um, make them uncomfortable. And then they kind of question, why am I comfortable? And they might question the very dynamic, which is making them comfortable. Not, not like the specifics of a Teddy Roosevelt statement or something, but um, just the dynamic in general. And yeah, I do want to, I do want to push those buttons and hopefully I mean, hopefully I always push those buttons. Hopefully it's not just this book, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think the artist's job really is to push buttons. That's what we're here for, you know? I mean, it's nice that we get flown around the world and have fun and stuff, but really we're supposed to, that's, we're, that's, that's our function in society, I think, mm -hmm. is to push buttons. 
And so the, the, the basic plot of the book is also about a mythology. And I don't even know if it's a true mythology. Is it a true mythology that, that you're dealing with? If it is, I don't know it. Really, I just wanted to bring Jason Voorhees up to the reservation and, and see what he would do against an Indian final girl, you know, but I couldn't, his, but his, his mask is trademarked, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't use his mask. So I had to come up with a different kind of Jason Voorhees and I came up with Elkhead Woman and I should have it right just here. Just clear here, the mask is always on your desk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I got a lot more stuff around here too, but, um, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, um, you know, there's a comic book by Elizabeth LaPense called Dear Woman, a Vignette, and I got that back in 2016, 2017, at the first Indigenous Comic Con, and I kept it over here to the left of my desk for a long time, because it's a beautiful cover, it's a woman with a big, fabulous deer head, and there, there is a long history of deer women, but, um, so I'm not really, I don't feel like I'm coming out of that tradition, I feel like I looked and looked at the cover, of Beth's book and that kind of triggered something in my head. So can you just for the for the folks that haven't read the book yet just give the the little the, the bullet point of, of the genesis of the book. Yeah oh you mean not my writing of it but like no, I mean, the, the plot. The plot yeah. yeah. Um, four guys are out in the field hunting elk one day and they make a bad decision and they leave thinking they got away with it for 10 years and on that anniversary something's coming for them and turning the hunters into the hunted and it'll all come down to a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> and so essentially they're being haunted by the ghost of uh, a dead uh, youthful elk, a calf. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm not, I don't want to disparage you, Stephen, but there's no way this should scare me. Like there's no way <laughs> that when I'm sitting in my little house here, I should be scared that the a ghost elk is going to come get me. But I was reading this book in the middle of a vast global pandemic, as we all are, in my bed at one o'clock in the morning, and I had to do what I did with old Stephen King novels, which was pick up the book, walk to the other room, put the book in the other room, <laughs> close the door, and go back to bed. Yeah. Why is a thing that I shouldn't be scared of so frightening? <laughs> what what is is it is it because w we all know we did that bad thing and that revenge is coming for us and it doesn't matter what the shape of that revenge is? That's exactly what I think it is. Yeah, I think we've all like um like when you were a sophomore in high, high school, maybe you broke up with someone like capriciously instead of for any kind of supposed real reason, and you kind of hurt that person. You could tell they were hurt. You went on with your life. What if five years later, or what if now, like 30 years later, they're coming for you, you know? Right. Um, I, I would hope, like, I think that's what the slasher does for the world is it makes us all reconsider our back trail. You know, what, right. what, what, what do we have standing up from the shadows we left? You know, what do we right. deserve, I guess? And um, yeah, I would hope also, like what, what scared me in this book, there's one moment where one of the characters is lying in bed on the second floor listening to footsteps come up the stairs kind of ponderously mm -hmm. and that re that really got to me when I was writing it and I realized that um we all don't know the people in our lives as well as we think we do you right know? and that's kind of to me fundamentally disturbing yeah I mean the that that there's a secret existence for all of us <laughs> right mm -hmm. that could be coming for us at some mm -hmm. point I think is always the the shocking thing um I think to the, you know, the idea of the family that you choose in your life, and in this case, the friends that you're surrounding yourself with, mm. um, where you're writing about people that might be sort of bad, but they love one another, and therefore there's some empathy for it. Um, you know, I, f I found that relationship between these four men, specifically these, these four friends, the thing that stopped me from hating them, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not typical, I think, in a horror novel, you know, that we shouldn't yeah. hate, the, we shouldn't identify with the villain, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, my problem with a lot of horror movies, I don't see this as much on the page, I see it more in movies, is that, you know, the first 60% of it before the final confrontation is these characters that, whom we already don't like getting picked off in increasingly right. worse ways. And we all cheer when, like, this person gets it, this character gets it. And 
I always feel kind of dirty about that, you know, because I'm not supposed to cheer for somebody like catching a scythe to the neck, you know, that's right. like, I don't think that's completely healthy. And, and so, yeah, in this one, I wanted to kind of ask the question um, first, which you were talking about, if you've done one bad thing, does that mean you're a bad person or does it mean you made a mistake? You know, right. should you be able to rehab or ask for forgiveness or whatever it is? Um, and second, what if we actually like these people and we're sad when they die? You know, I think that's a lot more <laughs> compelling a horror. Right. Well, and I think that's, that's the thing that is making readers really connect with this, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's a million horror novels that come out that aren't getting the sort of acclaim right now that yours is, is getting. And I think it is that personal thing. And I wonder too, if it's about this time that we're living in, um, where we value these relationships that we have with people and we start to care about them more because there's something larger out there that's coming for us, you know? Oh, yeah, and, right. and in your book, obviously it's, it's the, the ghost elf. Um, yeah. But for the rest of us, it could just be, you know, we, we go to Walmart and someone sneezes on us and yeah. we're doomed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the other thing that I think, um, I mean, I can talk about this book all day and, and I know you guys have lots of questions, so we'll get to you guys in just, just a second here. Um, is you're deconstructing also sort of the nature of what it means to be a young Native American person right now um, throughout the book and the associated horrors with that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the general horror mm -hmm. and then there's just the, hey, the undercurrent of someone's always gonna try and kill us. Mm -hmm. um, as you were writing it, were you worried that, oh, this isn't going to connect with Joe Blow, who doesn't have this concern, or was it or was it partly educational in that way? You know, I didn't even, I didn't worry about Joe Blow not connecting with it, and I actually didn't, like, consciously or intentionally pack that stuff in. It's just, like, I think all, all we all have like a political stance or belief or whatever, not necessarily an agenda, but we have like things that make us mad and things that make us happy in the world at large. And those things, you can't help but put those things on the page or I can't help put those things on the page anyways. It's like um, when you listen to a stand-up comedian and they're, they're mad about this, mad about that, it comes through really well. And maybe, they, maybe they're just going off the cuff. Maybe they wrote it all out beforehand for 14 days. I don't know. But um, or I guess they all do it differently probably. But for me, I was just kind of probably documenting what the world has been like for me growing up mm -hmm. and being who I am now too. And of course, trying to like undercut preconceptions and expectations, you know, while at the same time understanding that I'm sure I've internalized a lot of that stuff as well. You right. Know? Well, there's a, there's a great moment um, where uh, two of the characters are in a sweat lodge with a, uh, a teenage boy named Nathan and um, one of the, and these are the two of the people being hunted by the elk. Um, and one of the, the men says Indian and Nathan, the younger person says, you can't say Indian anymore, it's Native American. And I believe it's Gabe who says, you know, one Native American, two Native American, three Native American, four, that doesn't really quite ring. And you, as a reader, you laugh and then you're like, well, am, am I, am I doing it wrong also? Like, am I offending people? How, how am I doing this wrong? And it's yeah, a really yeah. savvy bit of storytelling on your part because you're also using Nathan, this young character, to stand in for the reader who has said mm -hmm. that same thing. It's not a convention that you normally see in a horror novel where you're making, <laughs> where you, where you're making people ask these sort of larger mm -hmm. cultural questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really adds a profound level of richness because they're also doing this thing that your non-Native American reader might think of as a cliche. They're in a sweat lodge for yeah, um, yeah. To, to get through this. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that that choice to do that? Yeah, and well, they're in the sweat lodge and they're listening to like drums and traditional singing, but it's coming off a cassette tape and a police cruiser, right. you know? <laughs> so it's, it's they're, um, rituals and ceremonies if they don't change they die you know and they've got to they've got to adapt with the times and so that's always one of my big pushes is that has to happen but yeah in that scene where Gabe is singing one little two little three little natives or whatever he's doing um I mean it as long as I've been on the scene the what we can call ourselves seems to change like every four or five years you know I'm used to it was 
indigenous and right now it's native and way back when it was Amer Indian and Native American is always floating up there too. And I don't like Native American as a term myself. I like, if I'm going to use a double, you know, like a hyphen term, I'm going to use American Indian because that puts us at the noun and makes America the modifier, makes America less essential to us, you know? Um, but yeah, the characters in here, they say Indian anyway, and it's on the cover, of course. And that's just, it's probably just the age I am, to tell the truth. Or either that or I can't learn new tricks, one of the two, <laughs> which is probably related. But um, like I grew up Indian and for me to to quit being Indian and now be native, mm -hmm. it just feels weird. It feels like I'm, like I'm trying to trade my identity or something. And that's right. that's what kind of, so Gabe is kind of me in that scene, if, if, if that can happen, you know? And um, Nate is the rest of the world, of course. Um, I do find myself, because I hear it so much, I use native sometimes as an adjective, like, um, I went to a native place or something, you know, um, mm. but Indian is how I always refer to myself anyways. Um, you know, and now that you're out here talking about the book and, and, have, and answering these same questions probably, or some version of them too, um, but in this particular time in, in American history, um, when identity is at the forefront of everybody's mind, mm -hmm and what we call each other and, and, and who's treated well and who's treated poorly and whose land belongs to who and all that stuff. Um, and then it turns out that you were writing a book that touches on all of these things on a subtextual level and then on a super textual level, but wraps it on a, around a, a horror novel, you know, about you know, who we are in this land that we live on and, and who we are in this given place and who we are when we leave this place and who we are when we marry outside of our race or our culture or whatever, all of these things that you were writing about or thinking about all of a sudden end up being the centerpiece of social tumult in America. Um, are you Nostradamus is basically what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, I just, uh, I really liked Jordan Peele's Get Out and I really liked Victor Laval's The Ballad of Black Tom and they were both doing the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, well before I did and, and a lot better, I'm sure. And I felt like both of those um, horror stories, I don't know, they opened a door that I could right. walk through, I think, you know? Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, what genre fiction does and what you have always done so well, um, you know, is you force the reader to ask bigger questions outside the text. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me with this book um, specifically, and also with, with some lesser extent to mongrels, um, is that you are forcing an uncomfortable conversation to happen inside of entertainment. And I, you know, I, I, if I wore a hat, I'd, I'd tip it to you um, because I think it's a super admirable thing to do within um, this little thing that we do to entertain people, you know, when they're sitting in their, in their overstuffed chairs. Uh, so my last question Thank for you, and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to the audience. Um, and we won't spoil it uh, because it's, it is the, the, near the end of the book, basketball plays a huge role in this book. Uh, and I happen to know it has played a huge role in your life because you've tore your Achilles tendon like 36 times. Folks, if you ever get to see Stephen Graham Jones in person again, forever free again, ask to see his legs because they look like a roadmap of bad decision making. <laughs> um, you know, but I, the, that you use basketball as both ritual and as bonding and as sex uh, in this book um, is, is really interesting to me. I know you played a lot. I, I know um, it's part of what you enjoy. Is what, what made you decide to, to place such a huge emphasis on it inside this book? You know, if, if I was taking some version of Jason Voorhees up to the reservation, then to me, it seems like it's unavoidable that he's gonna walk across a basketball court at some point. And you don't just walk across somebody's basketball court. That person's gonna say, you gotta ask permission to go across my court and right. you gotta beat me. You gotta beat me before you can go across this court, basically. And so I just, there was never any other choice. It was just always gonna be basketball. I never thought, you know, maybe they'll have a rock fight or maybe it'll be a demolition derby or maybe it'll be a game of chicken like in Footloose. I never, none of, the, none of those things were ever possible. It was always only gonna be basketball because I, I guess maybe it's because I built one of the characters such that to her, basketball is her identity. 
and the spirit of vengeance is not just about killing you it's about destroying you Mm -hmm. you know and the way you do that is you take away what's most dear to someone and basketball is most dear to this person but the use of basketball too the the way you dig into it is there is a ritual nature to it you know even the ritual nature of the free throw which you which you go into some uh, to length about but if even for the casual professional basketball fan you can you know like what Steph Curry does when he walks mm-hmm. up to shoot a free throw or or you remember Jeff Hornacek you know yeah. Yeah. patting his face before a free throw each person has a thing to get into their emotional or psychological rhythm before they shoot mm-hmm. that that one shot um and so then you begin to think about like all of the steps that are involved in the game all the personal things you have to do to be able to simply take that free shot uh and it it becomes a sort of religion you know if, if you're as dedicated as the characters in your book are but also yeah. as dedicated as you were or or many yeah. people are to the to the yeah. sport it has to be a philosophy yeah yeah and then at the end of it like you, you send up a prayer you know right <laughs> maybe it maybe it finds where it's supposed to go you know yeah i, I think it's it's a really um it's a it's a deft way to explore these larger things and, and forces the reader to think about it. Um, as a super unathletic, frumpy Jewish person, um, it made me want to go shoot hoops, but it's so hot. <laughs> I'm so short. Yeah, yeah. I have such I wanna, bad knees. <laughs> I want to I want to go shoot hoops too, but my my new rule, so I won't get any more surgeries, is I can't go on basketball courts anymore. So I keep oh, a, I keep man. this ball here and. When I'm thinking through a story problem, I dribble all around my study, you know? And mm-hmm. so well, far, that's worked want, out. We can, we can hook up on NBA 2K online, <laughs> and I can take you to the woodshed <laughs> via Clay Thompson raining threes on your ass if you want. I, I'm pretty good with my thumbs if I'm not so great with my elbows. Uh, well, let's get some questions from the audience. I know you guys have a bunch. Um, you can type them in the Q&A section. Um, if you have them in the chat and you want to move them over to the Q&A, let us know. Um, I believe Nancy is going to rejoin us now with uh, some questions. Hi, Nancy. Hello. How's it going there um, so in the, uh, the virtual world? It's going good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the first question is from Todd Peterson. He said he loved the bold of, the switch, of switching in and out of the second person. How did you come to realize this was the right way to write these sections? Um, I guess two, two different. The first part of this novel the section the house that ran red that was initially i wrote it in second person and then at the end in the very last line like i tried to pull the rug out from the reader and reveal that second person had been dramatic monologue the whole time which i thought was a wonderful cool move um my editor told me it's not as cool as you think it is so i dialed it (laughs) up to third person you know and but there were still all these moments that felt second person-y to me and so i let some of them stand but the more important the reason i put the second person in there is when you're watching a slasher movie or let's say you're watching halloween from 78 you start out in michael's mask looking like you know and i call that slasher cam it's where you're looking through the killer's eyes or look at how jaws starts jaws starts cruising through the, the seafloor looking through his doll eyes you know and almost every slasher will adopt that at some point. You'll hear the heavy breathing, you'll see the point of view, and th- there, thereby you'll know that this person is in jeopardy and being stalked at the moment. Terribly uncomfortable, <laughs> really hard to replicate on the page without, break, without doing a section break, you know? Right. And so, because a section break would be way too corny, I found that the only way I could do slasher cam on the page was to jump into, to dip into second person for a little bit. And there is a great moment actually very early on in the book when you are in second person from the Elk's point of view where I immediately was like, Peter Benchley is going to claw himself out of the grave. <laughs> it's a great moment. Um, Thank you. I used to read so much Peter Benchley. I oh love Peter Benchley, man. Peter Benchley was it for a little while. He was, he was. People forget, though, that Jaws the book also was a, uh, a stirring cultural criticism on, yeah. uh, on tourism. <laughs> it was and in and, and jaws the novel the shark isn't the scariest thing the scariest thing is um the mary Batty's wife yeah oh, sneaking right. out and stepping out on him you know yes <laughs> sleep with richard dreyfus or what yeah. what becomes richard dreyfus yeah yeah 
All right. Brief interlude yes. to discuss Jaws, the novel. Wait, I, I, <laughs> wait, I said Roy. I said Roy Batty. I think that's the character from. That's from Deliverance. No. No, that's that's from um, that Rutger Hauer movie, Philip J. Dick novel, The Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. Yes, uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Blade yeah. Runner. Yeah. Yeah. The the comments are going crazy. You moron! It's Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> but that isn't the sheriff's name. What is it's the sheriff's Roy, name? It's Roy Scheider, and the Roy sheriff's Scheider, name that's is. Yeah, yeah. We'll have some. We'll correct. We'll correct this in post before we put it up online. Don't worry. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right. all right, Nancy. Next question. Uh, I believe her name is Elise. Elise. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. But they asked, "Do you have the whole story in your head when you start to write, or do you dive in and let the characters lead the story?" No, I never have. I just I, I like fumble through and figure. Sometimes I figure it out. Sometimes I don't. Um. With the only good Indians, I didn't even know I was writing a novel. I thought I was writing a novella, and then I got to the end of the first section, and I'm like, "Oh, I guess it opened up. I'll see what happens." And I just kept running. And that the where the where this novel opens with um, Indian man killed in dispute outside bar, um, that initially was planted like about 65 percent through the novel, and then when I was rewriting it for the editor, I realized I can move that scene that opens the novel now I can move it ahead a chapter and behind a chapter it doesn't change anything which told me it was in a stupid place you know mm. it wasn't locked in place and so then I kind of asked myself how would us how would this how does the slasher genre or the scaffolding of the slasher genre tell me what to do and I immediately realized that um slashers always start out with one random death with one Casey Becker from Scream getting killed in her house you know talking on the phone and I thought I only have one death I can burn in that manner. And mm -hmm. so I slid, I slid that all the way to the front and it happened to fit perfectly, but I didn't write it to go there. It, it the open like chapter where, where Ricky Boss Ribs gets it is, uh, is great and completely Thank unexpected you. because you also don't know what you're reading. And so it's really sort of a, a gutsy way to open the book because it, it has so many questions unanswered, but it's also super creepy. I mean, a lot of the questions are answered if you just flip the book over and read what it says on the back. <laughs> or read any of the reviews. All the or reviews, the reviews yeah. go through everything. Huh? Right. I mean, if you just get the book in the mail in brown covers, you have no idea what's about to happen. Yeah. yeah. All right, Nancy, what's next? Um, uh, more or From Blair, more than one reviewer has called this work literary. Liter <laughs> literary? Do you agree? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? What literary means to me, um, and I learned this, is it, a critic named Robert Scholes, he might have said this like 40 years ago, maybe 50, um, that literary is that which you can return to time and time again and unpack more and more. It's got, every time you go back to it, you find something that you missed the time before. Um, that's what literary means to me. I think the way literary is used is an indicator of quality or caliber. And really, it's used a lot more sketchy than that. People use it to use it as an adjective for what they like, you know, right. and that doesn't have anything to do with its quality. Um, but yeah, this book sometimes gets called literary horror. And I mean, I'm just glad they call it, call it anything in the first place. And I'm glad they remember the horror too. They don't call it like dark fiction or a thriller or any of that stuff. Cause it is horror. I, I consider myself a horror writer, but um, I think literary horror as a term kind of is an insult to everything that doesn't get called literary horror. You know, yeah. it's like saying this is better than all that stuff. And I mean, all that stuff is great too. Um, and it's terrible too. There's terrible and great everywhere, and, and on every shelf, of course. Yeah, I don't, so I'm, I don't agree with elevated or literary horror. Um, I am glad if people are using it as a term of like adulation or something. Then um, of course that's great and honor and everything. I just don't want to insult the rest of stuff, if that makes sense. I, I think a lot of times um, for genre fiction, they apply literary to it when what they mean to say is it's more intellectually stimulating than the other stuff I read. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's also, I think it's also a way that people allow themselves to engage what they might otherwise consider a trashy genre right. or something. Absolutely, you know? I agree, yeah. I agree. Okay, Nancy, next Actually, question. This is like a great game show. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley wants to know how hard was it to do what you did to Shaney? She was one of um, her uh, favorite characters. Well, we, we can't, um, we don't wanna reveal Spoil. any spoilers. So yeah, just Shaney, say it was hard or not hard. <laughs> yeah, Shaney, Shaney gets cursed with immortality is what happens. Um, um, but no, yeah, it's, it, if 
that's the way it is in horror. Like you create these characters whom you love and you invest, like I emotionally invest in every one of the people I write about and everything bad that has to happen to them hurts me and makes me feel guilty even. And it's weird to feel guilt for a imaginary creature, if that makes sense, you know, but I do, I feel bad. Um, and but I didn't choose to write in, um, about caterpillars and board books, you know, for kids. I chose to write horror and people are gonna get decapitated and terrible things are gonna happen. And, but you know, just with fiction in general, even fiction that doesn't have mortal stakes, you still gotta push your characters through an emotional wood chipper or something. You've gotta be cruel to them at every turn. Um, if you don't, then they're gonna feel coddled, I guess. And when your characters feel coddled, your story is not engaging anymore, I don't think. I think we can all agree, though, that you, if you start doing picture books about caterpillars, <laughs> I'm not saying you'd be bigger than, I don't know who the, the king of the, the picture book is, yeah. but I think Stephen Graham Jones' caterpillar books would be a very big seller. <laughs> That'd be fun. All right, Nancy, what else you got? Um, Peggy wants to know, what school did you go to in West Texas? I went to Greenwood, mostly. I also went to Midland Lee but I got kicked out of Midland Lee because I think there were 82 days in a semester and I had 83 absences somehow. So they said, you can't go here anymore. <laughs> um, and I also got kicked out of Greenwood. I got kicked out of a lot of schools that I went to. They did not want me at their schools. Actually with Midland Lee, the reason I had all those absences was I actually showed up the first day. It was my senior year. I was gonna be a good student for the first time ever and make everybody proud. But I showed up to government class at like 8.30 in the morning and I'm sitting in the back of the class and the, the teacher walks in and she cases the place, you know, trying to get her, her, her threat on or whatever. And, and she looks at me and she says, you in the back right there. And I said, me? And she said, yeah, you get your greasy head off my chalkboard. And so I got up and I walked up and I never came back to high school. <laughs> have, you, have you engaged in the magical thinking of coming back and saying, you know, you can call me Dr. Jones because I know I've earned it? <laughs> I got to no, I don't remember her name. <laughs> because yeah, no, I would I do that. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I would film it. If we just, Stephen, if we just went around with a like a an iPhone and went to everyone who disrespected you as a child and you said, you can refer to me as Dr. Jones, that would That'd be, be the fun. popular videos on YouTube. Yeah. I remember in seventh grade, I had the, the science teacher, she marched me to the front of the classroom and she made me standing against the chalkboard with my back to the chalkboard facing the class. And she told everybody in class for like five minutes we had to, did to do this. She said, I want you to look at Steven right now. Y'all think he's funny, but you look at him in five years and see where he, where he is. It's not going to be so funny anymore. And I remember standing up there and thinking, where am I going to be in five years? What's going to happen in five years? You know, and um, then I made everybody laugh in some way and then it was all good. <laughs> Yeah, we need to find this woman and do it. Like, we need to actually have a limited series on Netflix where you just go around and meet people from your childhood and say, I'm back from the future. It's been five long years, and here I am, Miss Detweiler, whatever her name is. Yeah, <laughs> Miss Ward. Yeah, yeah. But I had another teacher in high school. This is when I was going to a different school than all these. She was really big on the idea of me moving in with her, you know? and she'd always be trying to talk me into moving in with her, but her husband who also taught at that school would always be standing like a body length behind shaking his head. No, like this is <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One last question, Nancy, and then we will uh, let Steven take off his fancy clothes and, and go watch uh, baseball on the television set. <laughs> basketball, 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 Bubble basketball for Stephen Graham Jones. <laughs> Pick a good one, Nancy. Ooh. No pressure. No pressure at all. Let me see. Man, it got dark. I had to turn on a lamp. I didn't realize the sun was going down <laughs> around here. Sorry about that, y'all. It's all right. Makes you look mysterious. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to come pouring in. I have some comments if you want me to read them out loud. You can give us one good comment. We must kill our darlings. Do you know what that means? <laughs> yes, that's a, it's an aphorism. It's a good one. It's a good one. Well, if there's um, no more questions, let me we see. won't force the issue with Mr. Jones here. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, Stephen Graham Jones' brand new book, The Only Good Indians. It is out right now. You can get it wherever you buy your books. But if you could, 
go visit uh, mysteryinc.com. Our friend Debbie has it for sale there. She could really use um, uh, the sales. Um, and you're helping out a good person who's always helped us out at UCR. Stephen Graham Jones, uh, congratulations on all the success for this fantastic book. It is absolutely well earned, my good dear friend. Uh, and thank, thank you, you all for coming. Hope you guys come back in September when we'll be joined by the novelist Darren Strauss. Take care, everybody.